Hello everyone, Vlad is here again, and that means today we are going to create a new diorama. This video will be different from the previous one, because this video will include the assembly of the Soviet tank BT-7 from UEM models, tank painting, figure painting, and the complete assembly of the entire diorama. So get ready to watch lengthy video. As always, I start from tank assembly. But while I am examining and laying out the parts, let me tell you a bit about this tank. BT-7 is Soviet wheeled and tracked light tank from the 1930-1940 era. Its uniqueness lays in the fact that its track can be removed and it can operate on roads like a regular vehicle. You can find more detailed specifications about this tank in the internet, if you are really interested. Now back to the assembly. The tank parts well made, and this model is of better quality than the previous. There are issues that have caused a lot of frustration during the assembly process. Firstly, I separated the tank parts from the plastic frame and began removing unnecessary elements. There ended up being a whole bunch of parts, and I decided to consult the instruction. Unlike the T26, the BT-7 set seems more complex, and there is not a clear understanding of where to attach its parts. For instance, the side panel of the tank hull consists of three pieces. Two parts are easy to glue, but attaching the third one evenly is much trickier. Thankfully, attaching the side panel to the hull wasn't a problem, and now this pile of parts is slowly becoming a tank. When I had assembled about 50% of hull, I realized it. it was time to put together the wheels. I didn't make mistake. BT-7 actually has wheels instead of traditional tank chassis. Assembling the tank wheels was straightforward. And at this point, I thought there would be any issues. But that was until the assembly reached the tank tracks. I was really displeased with the front rollers. Firstly, they're challenging to attach evenly. Secondly, the quality of parts could be better. While attaching these parts, you constantly need to hold them in place to prevent them from bending as they please. Novices like me will face significant challenges. This is only my third tank, and my experience is initially zero. Then I glued on the track guards, which are decently made with nice detailing, but due to issues with the glue quality, I ended up ruining the model. Of course, I could have by specialized model glue, but in the past few months, I've been spending a lot on this hobby, and I'm afraid these expenses might just get me kicked out of my house. <laughs> well, it's not funny, but... Uh, oh, well... As you can see, the tank hull is almost assembled. However, the front part of the hull, where the tank driver's hatch is located, simply wouldn't attach properly, and I had to file down the hull to get that part to fit correctly. As a result, I ended up with a somewhat misshapen tank body with numerous mistakes and issues with part not fitting precisely according to the instruction. I began to realize that this kit might not as good as it seemed. Towards the end of the assembly, more and more problems arose. I attempt to hide the gaps of the tank hole by using melted plastic, but I can't say it was very effective. The model does look better than before, but some details still stood out too much. So I decided to create a few damages on the right side of the tank. It turned out um, okay, uh, just okay. I decided that some of the issues could be concealed by adding various accessories to the tank for extra detailing, so there is nothing more to touch now. Here's what we have after assembling the tank hole and turret. There were no problem with the turret, it's nearly impossible to mess up, so I managed to get it right. However, now I face the task of working on the tank tracks. Plastic tracks are a headache. While they do look more realistic compared to the rubber ones, they create many more problems. 
and all these problems start during the assembly process. Assembling the track for BT-7 tank is very challenging, due to the small parts that don't fit together well at all, resulting in the track look like long, thin pieces of plastic. Yes, there are a few issues in the end, but I plan to conceal this problem on the finished diorama. So, here is what we have in the end. I just needed to use 4 to each parts and our tank will be fully assembled. One evening I couldn't go to sleep until I came up with some additional accessories for my tank. I will show you the finished work, since I sculpted without using a camera. But if you're really interested in learning how to make uh, stuff from green epoxy resin, just let me know this request in the comments. As you can see, I've added a few sacks of potatoes, a small tarpaulin at the back of the tank, and a large sack on the top of turret. I wanted to add a few more elements, but I didn't want to turn the tank into a shopping cart full of goods, so I am limiting in these accessories. Now it's time to move on on painting the tank. As usual, I started with a black to add deep shadow to the tank and give the entire model an iffy and black appearance. After that, I moved on to applying the third layer of khaki color. In my previous diorama, I made the tank to green and, to be honest, it ended up looking more like frogs than a Soviet khaki colored tank. This time I corrected that and I'm actually seeing the color turn it out much more interesting. Next, I started painting the sex and other accessories that I added to the tank. I kept the sex and tarpaulin quite simple, but I believe this look adequate and decent for 172 scales. This is the result I achieved and I am satisfied with it. Now it's time to move on to edit chipping and rust, essentially the process of weathering. This means transformation our beautiful tank into a battle-worn warrior aged by time. Some of the effects were achieved using a kitchen sponge, which is an excellent tool for model painting. When the result was satisfactory, I moved on to adding rust to the tank. In some areas, I wanted to make it heavily rusted. I had the idea that this tank often draw through densely wooded areas frequently be hit by debris from explosions. So, in certain places, I tried to add substantial amount of rust, and it actually looks quite good. The rust gives the tank a more realistic appearance and shows that it's not just a 172 scale mod and waiting in the box on my shelf, but rather a tank that represents a high quality scaled down version of the real BT-7 tank. Currently, I am continuing to use rust on my tank, and I want to focus on the engine grill. I have seen various videos, photos and 3D models of the BT-7 tank engine grill. It looks different everywhere. Some people paint it in a completely rust color, some make it black, and some, like me, paint the grill in a protective khaki color, add chipping and scratch, and then apply rust for weathering. I'm not sure if it's right, but as it seemed to me, it looks more pleasant and interesting than having the entire rear parts of the tank in a fully rusty color. As for the tank's exhaust, I paint them in a rusty color. The exhaust turned out quite well, and I just need to add the smoky effect to complete them. Now we move on, on to painting the tank's tracks. And I thank my lucky stars that painting the tracks is much easier than assembling them. However, I realized that I rushed and forgot to apply chipping and scratches to the wheel and damaged parts of the hull. Let's correct this oversight. Now I can focus on the tank's tracks. And in reality, painting them is the easiest part. Painting the tracks, a color assembly and fresh rust is quite satisfying. Using a silver paint, I highlighted the exposed areas and parts that touch the ground. And that's it. The only thing left is to add dust and dirt. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the diorama itself and the figures I have chosen for this project. I had several ideas, because I want each diorama to be different. 
I want to try something new in each project. For example, in my previous diorama, I positioned it as an autumn scene. It was green with a touch of yellow, so this one will be brown, with fresh mud and a warm season of the year. Let's say it's the end of summer. Late August, maybe early September, I'm not entirely sure. But let's get back to the figures. I have around 200 figures in 172 scale. Mainly it's Soviet and German soldier. I don't want to depict a battle scene. That's an idea for the next diorama. In this time I interested in portraying a situation where the tank's track came off right and a railroad crossing and tank got stuck. Meanwhile, two ten crew members are arguing, trying to fix the situation. Their commander is flirting with a girl who is controlling traffic at the crossing. I thought about this idea for a long time, and there were even a few nights when I couldn't sleep until I made a progress toward a goal of this diorama. I made the diorama base out of foam board, as usual. This time I joined two pieces of foam board together. I believe that a taller diorama looks much more interesting and appealing to the viewer than a low one. The corners of the diorama were beveled. I create slight slopes. This was done to show that the railroad crossing is situated on an elevated surface. After that, I marked the approximate location of the railway and the tracks left by vehicles that had been there. Next, I needed to create the ties and prepare the rail, which I recently purchased. I made the ties from simple coffee stick. It's really cool material for diorama. And sometimes you can even get it for free. I intentionally glued the rails and tiles at an angle. Diorama can look dull and uninteresting if every scene is done at right angles, so I try to avoid that as much as possible. Here is the result. Now I need to work on creating the crossing itself, using the same coffee stick. There's not much to explain here. I simply glued the sticks together to create a wooden platform. For added detail, I added a road sign. At this stage I only made the post. Next I drilled holes for nails on the ties. But in the end I worked poorly with the texture paste, destroying all the detail. Fortunately this didn't affect the final result too much. Now it's time to make the texture paste. The recipe is simple. Modeling plaster, a bit of acrylic paint, water and PVA glue. This time I intentionally made a trick paste to simulate wet mud and keep the vehicle tracks sharp. Is it convenient to work with this paste? Absolutely not. Working with it is quite challenging and inconvenient. It's very sticky and resembles dough. I regret not using self-hardening clay, which I evenly use it to fill gaps on this diorama. Of course, doing something with your hands from scrap material is often more satisfying than using ready-made supplies. But sometimes it can be challenging and the result might not always turn out aesthetically pleasant. For instance, this time I decided not to add sand to my texture paste, which I used to do previously. As a result, the texture ended up being smooth and even, which isn't exactly what I aim to for. Nevertheless, there's still some relief on the diorama, which means I can work with it to achieve the desired effect. Of course, diorama need to have stones. I added them enhances a natural look. Even if the mixture were more liquid, the stones would appear more realistic. However, with some additional effort, I'm confident the outcome will be satisfactory. Now it's time to make our diorama visually appealing. The foam board on the side of diorama doesn't look very pleasant. So, I opted to use special sheet that mimics the texture of wood. After careful consideration among several options, 
I found one that suits this diorama perfectly. The result turned out quite well and added an interesting view to the side of our diorama. Moving on. We'll proceed with the grass application and prepare a diorama for painting. I started by planting 2mm grass from IKEA Interactive, creating small grassy patches on the diorama. Next I added longer grass made from an old brush. I didn't use too much grass to emphasize the dirt and destruction on the broken clay road. I'm satisfied with the grass application. It brings added vibrancy to this scene. After completing the grass planting, the next step is to protect the side of the diorama from paint splatters, to preserve the texture and details. This is an essential step before applying primer to the entire surface of the diorama. The primer will provide a consistent background and prepare the surface for the upcoming stage. Now we can proceed with painting the grass. By the way, I borrowed the diorama painting technique from the Night Shift channel. It's a really effective method to create uniformity across the diorama, making it easier to distinguish between grass, soil and rocks. Additionally, the use of black paint creates intriguing deep shadows, adding a scene of volume to the diorama. After applying the base coat of paint to the grass, I add a touch of lighter color to diversify the vegetation. Then it's time to paint the soil. I've chosen a brown color to represent the clay rod by adding a bit of lighter paint over the base color. Now this diorama already starts looking quite impressive. Next step is paint the wooden elements. This includes the railroad ties, the crossing and giving attention to the road sign. I applied the paint to the wooden parts in three stages to create variation in texture and they already appear promising. Next step is painting the rails to achieve that rusty look. While the rails are used regularly, the lower inside parts should display the effect of weathering, thus the rusted appearance. Now I'm refining the ground's details. It's important to diversify the earth stones, paint the rocks, and this will contribute to the pleasant result. Attention is now turned to the road sign. I found a few interesting designs in internet and decided they would fit well with my diorama. This sign will create a striking contrast against the overall brown tones of the scene. We are nearing the final steps now, including working with pigments. However, I must admit I am still figuring out how to master this technique fully. Hopefully, I will improve my skill by my next project. I thought it would be a good idea to add dry flock, which simulates small sticks and pieces of grass. Upon closer inspection, this adds an extra layer of atmosphere. The outcome looks quite impressive. Now we need to use of oil paints. We are adding depth to the diorama, bringing it to life. Following that, I used a dry brush technique to highlight certain areas, particularly the tracks left by vehicles. With that, the groundwork is now entirely finished. Now it's time to focus on the figures. For this project, I'm once again using Tanker figures from the Aryan company. I found a few interesting posts that suit my diorama well. Admittedly, I'm not an expert at figure painting especially in the 172 scale. There are true masters out there who can make figures in this scale look astonishing. Nonetheless, I believe the results are satisfactory, enough to add a few details to our diorama. And there you have it, the final steps. I place all the diorama components in their respective places. I can now confidently say that project is complete 
and I am content with both the process and the result. If you watched this video all the way to the end and enjoyed, I kindly ask you to give this video a like and a dislike if it didn't resonate with you. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, that means a lot to me. And if you want to support me financial, you can subscribe to my Patreon. It will be a tremendous form of support and an extra intensity for me to release video sooner. Thank you all. This was Vlad from the No Quality Diorama channel. Goodbye and have a great day.